who doesn't know me, um, my name is Susanna Mills. I'm the editor-in-chief of the American Philatelic Society. Um, so I do the AP, the Philatelic Literature Review, um, Stamp Ed, a bunch of other stuff. And I also have a terrible cough, so I will try to mute myself whenever that happens. And I'm sorry in advance. And I am Nora Bryson. I am the APS digital editor um, and also sort of your host this evening. So glad to be here. Glad you're all here with us. Okay, um, we have a question. Um, will we be able to share our screens? Panelists will be able to share your screens. Um, we'll, you'll also be able to be on camera and talk if you'd like. Um, there are several people who sent things in in advance. Um, if you are one of those people and you're here tonight, if you could just throw in the chat whether or not you'd like to be on camera or speak, or if you'd like us to cover your material for you, um, whatever you'd prefer. Uh, but yes, anybody who um, would like to share and would like to share your screen, you'll be able to do that once we make you a panelist. And we'll also go over um, some small details once uh, everyone has filtered in and everybody has shared whether or not they would like to um, whether or not they would like to share. I may have to relaunch the poll. Oh, no, looks like it's all good. Um, anybody who's just coming in, uh, we have a poll up. I just let us know if you'd like to share something during the show and tell. I know a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people really enjoy sharing their stamps. Um, this may be the first time or at least the first time in a long time that we've done a show and tell kind of experience with the APS. Um, so for us, at least, this is a bit of, a, of an experiment. Uh, so bear with us. We're going to figure out what's, what works, if people like it, and um, possibly do this again in the future. Should I get us started now? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Okay, so I'm, I'm the guinea pig. I'm going to go first. Um, and I have my material. Um, I took some scans earlier of just a few items, which I will share now. So here are a few items from my collection. Um, so as you can see here, uh, I've been collecting skulls, skeletons. Um, really, I'm drawn to anything kind of spooky, but the skulls and skeletons are what really get me excited. Um, so here on the top left, we have from Poland. Uh, this is a 1984 issue, uh, The Ecstasy of St. Francis of Assisi by El Greco. Um, so that was painted back in 1580, um, actually. So like when you look it up, there are about a hundred different versions of this painting um, because he kept on getting commissioned to paint it for a bunch of different churches. Um, and this one specifically uh, was an unknown painting until they uh, kind of uncovered it in 1966 in Poland. So I would guess this is one of the more recent ones that have been uncovered. And we've got a little skull in the corner. And I also think this looks like a skull kind of cloud, so I could be persuaded otherwise. Uh, from Hungary, uh, this is a 1975 environmental protection issue. There are several in this series. Um, and there's actually another one that I am going to search out that also has a skeleton hand called Stop Pollution. Um, so I have another added to my list. Of course, here uh, we've got the Jolly Roger, um, which was bizarrely included in a Great Britain, excuse me, <laughs> talking with a cough is going to be very obnoxious, so I appreciate your patience. Um, a 2001 issue from Great Britain, um, and it was included in a flags and ensigns issue with like actual Great Britain naval flags. 
Um, so I wasn't aware that the Jolly Roger was um, a naval flag, but for some reason it was included there. Uh, here we have a semi-postal from the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic in 1923. Um, this one is called Famine, and it was a semi-postal series intended to raise uh, money against, against famine. And there's another stamp in this issue as well that has um, uh, the, de the death, the kind of Grim Reaper character pictured. Here from Slovenia, this is a single stamp. It was actual. It was actually two issues, but this is just one of them. Um, and those two issues depict part of a very long fresco that was um, the Dance of Death fresco. So essentially, um, this Slovenian church uh, had a bunch of surviving medieval frescoes on the walls that they were able to restore that were painted in like 1490. Um, so essentially it's skeleton and then the king and then a skeleton and the queen, skeleton, the bishop, skeleton, a burglar, um, a child, like a, a pregnant woman, all these different people from society. And the idea is that they're all kind of marching to the grave, which is um, very dire and exactly what I enjoy looking at on a stamp. Um, and then finally, here we have from Kenya. Um, this was from a series, The Origins of Mankind, and had uh, fossilized skulls. Um, so there are three others from this series. Yeah, and that's just a few from my, my Grim Reaper death skulls and skeletons collection. Well, and now you, you can tell me in the oh. chat if they're cool or not. <laughs> or too spooky. Um, <laughs> thank you for sharing, Susanna. Um, just for everybody's general, full, excuse me, general knowledge, because I realized we forgot to talk about this at the beginning. Um, if you do want to share, uh, what we'll do is uh, make you a panelist and that will have Zoom kind of like kick you out and then you'll immediately come back in as a panelist. You'll be able to turn on your video and your audio or to share your screen. Um, so I actually would like to get started with some of the people who sent their information in early. So let's pull that up here quickly. Okay, and while you're doing that, I will read out. Eric says, the Royal Navy submarines use the Jolly Roger. Thank you, that, <laughs> that explains that. I was very confused. <laughs> okay, um, I would like to uh, put up Praveen's first. Um, so Praveen uh, collects, uh, or at least uh, it collects partly uh, Bhutan, and um, some of you may have seen in the most recent issue of Stamp Ed, um, we have this image of one of the very famous Bhutan record stamps. Um, Praveen collected this in Bhutan, I believe, 50 years ago. Um, and this is the, uh, the history of the country in English. Uh, so it's absolutely beautiful. I believe there are, um, I think, two other ones in the series, maybe more. Uh, if somebody knows, you could put it in the chat. That would be great. Um, but you can actually play this on a record player. Um, so it's a great addition to a topical uh, music collection, a dragon collection, uh, anything like that. Um, so it's a really beautiful stamp. And just for a little shameless self-promotion i'm also going to share that in the stamp it oh wow seven record stamps that's a lot they're really beautiful stamps if you haven't taken a look at them they're they're amazing and you can put them on letters which is wild um so this is stamp ed oh did i skip past that page already susanna knows susanna put this together well, I will find it and we'll share it a little. Oh, Praveen knows. Okay, perfect. <laughs> uh, here we go. Maybe. 
So sorry, everyone. Thank you again for your patience. Ah, here we go. Okay, so this is our direct messages section in Stamped. You can see both the record and the lovely Valentine we received from Michael Jones. Um, and we would love if you would send us direct messages, uh, which is our version of letters to the editor. But in the meantime, uh, let's move on. We also have sharing with us today, uh, Susan Jones. Just kidding, here's mine again. No, I'll go back. <laughs> Actually, we're okay. going to talk about skulls a little bit more, everyone. No, but someone asked if I was going to make an exhibit on them. Um, no, but I am considering um, doing like an ATA one page exhibit on something. Not quite sure yet. Um, uh, does anyone else do a one page exhibit with the ATA? Please let me know. Um, it looks really fun. Okay, um, yeah, this is a one-page exhibit I put together this year for the ATA's one-page exhibit. It's an online show. There's no judging or anything. But this is um, the Age of Reptiles stamp that was derived from a mural that appears in the Peabody Museum at Yale University. And the reason I chose to show this one is because, um, first of all, paleontology on stamps is my primary collection. I'm a retired geologist. And during my entire 20 plus years of being a geologist, I never once got to use paleontology. So when I got ready to retire, I um, decided this would be a good opportunity to collect stamps. And I started with the ATA checklist for paleontology, which as of this morning had almost 4,300 stamps on it. But I decided to get a little specific or more selective. So I picked the stamp, which is shown, on, part of it's shown on a postcard. And then I also was able to get EFOs, freaks and oddities related to, for that stamp. And um, just to show, pick this one to show how you can take a topic and expand it almost any way you want to postcards, a, a maxi card, and especially down the right side, I've got printing errors. Uh, and then the re real one is the lower left, the uh, way it was issued. So that's the first one, just kind of how you can expand a topic. Okay, I also collect goldfish. It seems like topical collectors rarely have one collection. But this one's fancy goldfish, and it's because I happen to like goldfish. This was the first attempt at a one-page exhibit for ATA, and it shows a postcard from a very, very early goldfish breeder and dealer in the United States, because that's the part of the story that interested me. How did goldfish that were developed in China end up in the United States? And I also use these little one pagers as a way of like thinking how I might develop this into an exhibit. And in this case, it's like I said, it's the postcard of this early uh, dealer. And then on the bottom is a set of 12 stamps beautiful stamps from China from 1960 that show all the various kinds of goldfish you can find, you know, bubble eyes, veil tails, but this is what they developed. And eventually goldfish just became popular around the world. Next. And this is a second topical collection, Native American, um, on Native American, mostly arts and crafts on stamps. And this happens to be a the Northwest Indian masks from 1980, the block of four. And I just like cachet maker Ralph Dyer. He's one of the few cachet makers that I will, um, that I collect along with this particular group of stamps. But one day when I was at America, or I think it was in Columbus, Ohio, I happened to find the little pencil drawing, and that is the template that he used 
and transferred to each of his covers and then colored from that. But you'll, if you were to have the time to sit and look at it really, really closely, you'd see that there are differences between the template and his actual final cachet. So this is another way that a topical collection can take off and go in a different direction. With me, it was the first day covers and then finding the um, artwork, the template that the cache maker put together. So that's, and this is again, another way to take a piece of something out of my collection and research it and write it up so I know what I have in my collection. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. I, um, I share your uh, pain about not being able to use the paleontology. I also studied geology and uh, in another life. Um, and it was a big disappointment to not encounter any dinosaur bones. I never used it. <laughs> All right. So now we are going to share uh, Joe's uh, submission. So I'm going to pull that up on our screen. Oh, um, yes. Okay. I'm going to pull that up on our screen. Yeah, I'm here. Well, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm here. Yep, I can uh, hear you just fine. <laughs> good. Um, like a number of collectors, like Susan, I'm a retired university professor, 57 years of teaching economics in a business school. I retired at 81 years of age, looking for the revival of my stamp collecting which goes back to grammar school like it was probably in most of our history. But I decided, or I was looking for a couple of goals in retirement. One was to organize my uncle's Americana collection. He was an early member from the 1955 of the ATA, and he was also one of the early members of the Americana unit. And I kind of inherited his Americana stamps and I've been trying to organize them. But then I got the idea of trying to put together or joining my vocation in economics and business and my avocation in stamp collecting. And I'm working on a manuscript which is now a hundred pages long. And uh, it's basically a philatelic economic and business history of the United States. It has about 200, I've selected about 200 stamps, most of which are in my collection, not the old ones, but the new ones. And I've written an, a short essay on each of these. And in addition to that, I set up a chapter where I keyed the stamps to my course outline in economic history. So if you're talking about uh, manufacturing in American economic development, I identified the stamps that were related to manufacturing. And there are many such stamps. That basically is like a, a, a mini course within this manuscript. And then I have a checklist of, of these 200 or so stamps. And I also have some industry studies. For example, I have an industry study of the toy industry. Toys in the toy industry as part of, you know, American industry. I also have something on healthcare and something on automobiles. And I can do this. I can expand this as much as I want, or I can do it in different ways. In any case, I'm hoping to have this out as a uh, an ebook this summer. One of my former students is helping me with the technology, which I don't have. I mean, I can show you a picture of the book, you know, and, you know, I got people like... Uh, Thomas Edison, and obviously uh, Alexander Graham Bell, bankers, business organizations, industry organizations. But that's been keeping me busy, and I'm enjoying that. 
I haven't expanded beyond the United States. I'm, right now, I'm staying with the United States. So it is a philatelic economic and business history. That's my story. That's great, Joe. It's, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm also very interested in that topic. So please let us know uh, when you have that ebook ready to go and we'll uh, spread the word. Right. It's a, it's a word document now that <laughs> runs about 100 pages. Wow. They, they say it has to be translated into some other like, some other <laughs> formatting, but whatever. Um, yes, that's my that's my story. Awesome. Thank you so much. All I do right. think it's interesting as the as we get the next person teed up. Um, I think that there are probably a lot of people who collect um, things related to their to their career to their job. Um, so if that's you, I mean, we've heard, um, we've heard that already. So if that's you, you should toss it into the chat and tell us if you collect, uh, stuff related to your, to your career or your previous studies. I actually have a poll about that. Oh, do you? I that's do. Perfect. Yeah. For me right now, that would mean collecting stamps, maybe stamps on stamps. Stamps on stamps is quite fun. I do stamps on stamps, mail on stamps. Um, there was a Europa series. Uh, I think it was either two years ago or three years ago, I think, that was historic postal routes of Europe. Fascinating. Perfect. Loved it. <laughs> All right. While we're answering that poll, it looks like Rob is just about ready to go. So take it away whenever you're ready. Okay. So um, I'm another retired academic and um, another geologist. I actually had contact with Susan at some point about uh, a, a session on what I called the geophilately at a regional geology meeting. And I've also had contact with uh, Sarah about my other topic on the international geophysical year. Uh, but my second topic that I collect on is uh, uh, North American earthquakes. And in the few slides I'm going to show you, I'm going to focus on the uh, Santa Barbara 1925 earthquake because we're coming up to its centennial. And so I'm kind of envisioning, I've done several of the ATA one page exhibits. So I'm envisioning this uh, for next year. And I thought I can get a head start on it with this, this session. So um the, the photo of me is uh, when I still had some uh, brown hair, but uh, although I'm a geophysicist, I'm not a seismologist per se, but I was in charge of our seismographs at Franklin and Marshall College where I taught. This was back in the old days of the drum recorders, and now we're digital. I'm not in charge anymore, but uh, um, I guess I know enough seismology to be dangerous. So um, I have to give you a, a, like a short tutorial on earthquakes. Uh, so uh, first of all, you can tell me whether you think this is a topical collection or not. Uh, there's no United States postage stamps on earthquakes or any other natural disaster. Uh, so what I have are actually mostly uh, postcards, I uh, a few letters and, and covers, uh, but the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee's criteria on stamp selection excludes things that might be perceived, I guess, as negative aspects of the United States, including natural disasters, which they're really natural, aren't our fault. But there are a couple of Cinderella stamps in my collection that I show here, one from the uh, fundraising for the San Francisco earthquake in 1906, and then one uh, at, uh, at Westpex for its centennial 100 years later. So, there are earthquakes in the United States. Uh, I'm skipping my slides on plate tectonics, but uh, many of you probably know, especially the couple of geologists here, that uh, the red here shows plate boundaries, and uh, there's lots of earthquakes on those plate boundaries, and some of them are quite uh, large. Uh, the inset here is the rest of the United States, uh, where I show magnitudes greater than five. Uh, so... Um, I have earthquakes, uh, uh, sorry, postcards and other items from a number of quakes. So in this little graph, I give the year of the quake represented in my collection and its magnitude. 
So Santa Barbara here is kind of right about in the middle of both the timeline and the magnitude range. Uh, I now have, I've been doing this for a few years, and I now have over 300 items in my collection uh, on 19 U.S. earthquakes. I have a few from uh, the Caribbean, uh, from Central America. I have nine different California earthquakes, and these are the ones most represented in my collection. Uh, so I only have four items from the Santa Barbara earthquake, so I'm going to show all of those, and I'll be looking for more. Uh, these are the criteria that I, I try to satisfy for what I collect. S criteria are flexible, but I, I try to get uh, cards that have been mailed and still have a stamp on them that were postmarked soon after the earthquake from near the epicenter of the earthquake that includes a message about the event uh, that I can read uh, in decent condition and not too expensive. I think three out of my four satisfy that criteria. So I don't have to read all this text, but the earthquake happened kind of north of LA, Santa Barbara in 1925. Uh, its magnitude was 6.8. Uh, so that's moderately strong. The intensity, which reflects how much damage was done was Roman numeral nine. That scale goes up to Roman numeral 12. Uh, so many of the buildings in downtown uh, Santa Barbara were destroyed or badly damaged with a fair amount of damage. Uh, 13 people died. So that this puts it as one of the 10 most costly earthquakes in United States history. Um, I do have a picture I'll show you about the Mission Santa Barbara. Okay, so four, four items to show you. The stamps aren't anything really special. So to me, this is a topic, but whether that is considered topical collecting, you can you can argue that with me. Uh, but first is a real photo postcard. Uh, th this was a popular genre of uh, postcards in about the first 30 years of the uh, 1900s. There was, a, the, the, there was a Kodak camera that came out in 1903 where it actually uh, developed pictures onto postcard stock. And some of these have been mailed. Lots of them just went into people's scrapbooks. But this one was mailed. Uh, remember that the date of the earthquake was, what did I say, June 29th. Uh, and this postcard went out about a month later uh, from Santa Barbara uh, to someone in, uh, I guess that's Oakland, I think. Uh, the stamp is upside down. I don't know if that's a distress signal or not. Uh, here's the message. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a message about the earthquake. Everybody fine might mean they survived the earthquake okay, or it could be in something else. Not so sure about that. This was actually a little booklet uh, of uh, photos uh, about the Santa Barbara earthquake. This was sent out a couple months after the earthquake in August, and it was sent from Santa Barbara to Wisconsin. Uh, this is the mission that I mentioned before. Uh, this is the cover and the back of the um, a booklet. And there were 12 enclosed photos. Uh, so this is a photo of the, mo of the, of the mission and the two towers uh, that uh, were uh, damaged uh, by the earthquake. So these booklets were fairly popular. You can find ones like this for the uh, San Francisco earthquake, for the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. Uh, so I, I enjoy it when I find one of these. So the next two, last two slides uh, have the same image, actually. They're also, I guess, real photo postcards. Uh, this, in my collection, sets a record, which my wife says is ridiculous, but uh, it is the card I have that was sent the longest duration of time after the event occurred or after the postcard was made. So this was a 1925 event and postcard, uh, and this uh, uh, event, and then the card was sent in 1987. So you've got some different stamps on it. They're not really earthquake related or anything, but uh, the message is, uh, guess that Hildegard used to live here. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if that meant this building or just Santa Barbara, but. And then lastly, uh, 
same image, more or less. Uh, it looks like it's developed a little bit differently. Uh, but uh, this one was, again, sent from Santa Barbara, uh, just about a month after the earthquake, to someone in San Diego. And uh, this message seems to have nothing to do with the earthquake. So that's not my highest priority find, but I really haven't been able to find too many items that are posted from the Santa Barbara earthquake. So this was close enough that I went for it. And um, there was a, a recent article by Ray Burby in the uh, American Philatelist uh, about collecting natural disasters. And he includes uh, uh, earthquakes in, in his an article and a couple other publications he's had. And it had a very useful uh, uh, set of references that I've used to track down some other publications about um, natural disasters and earthquakes on stamps. I don't have any in this presentation, but many other countries have stamps about earthquakes that either show the damage or recognize a significant historical event or honor the people that uh, helped in the recovery or rebuilding after the earthquake. So while the United States doesn't want to do this, well, I guess the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee will have to answer that question. And that's it. Thank you. I have a lot of questions to answer in my mind. Uh, <laughs> Rob, interesting coincidence. I studied geology at FNM. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, I graduated in 2016, but I was over with the volcanologists. So okay. I don't think we'd cross paths. Well, but, I, yeah. I, re I retired. Uh, yeah, actually, that's uh, I retired in 2016. So probably just missed you and I didn't yep. I came in once in a while but not too much <laughs> it's cool. well so was that Bob Walter you worked with um I did work a little bit with Bob Stan? but um I was actually mostly working with uh Stan Mertzman and Andy okay. DeVette so okay. yeah yeah okay Missed them great guys but yeah, yeah it was great to cross paths like this <laughs> I'll see Andy uh in a couple nights so I'll mention that I ran into you yeah please tell him I said hello okay all right we're going to move right along uh, Leah Ko, I'm going to make you a panelist. Um, and in the meantime, I'm also going to share the results of the poll. Um, so it looks like uh, the majority of people had had their own reasons for why they collect. But other than that, uh, related to their hometown or where you live is a big topic, which I think is, you know, pretty, pretty accurate to what I've heard from other philatelists. So... So, uh, yes, a guide to topical collecting, because I didn't know how many experienced or non-experienced people would be here. And I have I'm a very active member of the American Topical Association, and I have several topics that I collect. And I just thought, well, I'll grab my dragons because they're the most fun. So collecting dragons turned out to be way more complicated than I thought, because I started out saying, oh, the year of the dragon, those are fun stamps. And. So many countries issue them and they're always fancy. And here's what Canada issued a few years ago. And at that time, Lynn Stamp News was posting things that you could capture the image. So later I bought this stamp, but this is from Lynn's having posted it as a shareable image. Um, and then this year, uh, Jersey has done the, this um, style of, they did two different stamps. This one gold with the black in a presentation folder with a gold dragon. And then they also did a gold dragon on a separate single stamp. So those are for this year's um, Year of the Dragon from Jersey. And then this is from 2012 from, um, let's see, that would be Albania. Am I right? Sprija? I think that's Albania. Hmm. Anyway, so those are all Year of the Dragon. And then I started realizing, oh, there's more dragons I know about because the Hobbit has a dragon. And of course, New Zealand has issued bunches of stamps. Unfortunately, they didn't ever issue a stamp from the Hobbit movie that has a dragon on it. But Great Britain has issued stamps commemorating the author Tolkien, and those have dragons. And I couldn't find my copy of the dragon that was in that set. So I just put movie poster up and then harry potter of course has a dragon on the fourth book and one of the issues that great britain did was all the covers of the harry potter series and so this one has the uh dragon in the fourth book the uh goblet of fire and then this is maleficent which is the bad witch in sleeping beauty who can turn into a dragon so i also grabbed that little image 
Um, and then dragons are in heraldry. So everybody can think of the Welsh dragon probably pretty quickly. And that's what this one is. But there's also the black dragon of Ulster, which is one of the um, heraldry uh, animals for the for Great Britain. So this has the black dragon of Ulster on this St. Helena issue. I'm not quite sure why Ulster is on the St. Helena issue, but there it was. So another dragon. Um, then there's a lot of legends about slaying the dragon. Sometimes it's Hercules, sometimes it's St. George, sometimes it's some other hero. So these are a little hard to see because they're so small, but this one is Czechoslovakia. This one is Germany. This one um, is Belgium. This one um, might be Russia, but it might also be Ukraine because those are hard to tell apart. And this was an issue that Great Britain did, and they did it. This one is Buchanaland, but the the issue here is that this big uh, frame around the portrait of the king has a little dangle on it, which is St. George killing the dragon. So I have to find all of those, but right now I just have that one. Um, then other dragons, this is um, from Iceland, and these are uh, spirit animals that they did a series of, and they did them in three or four different colors, and I put the blue one up. Um, and then... This is a um, China issue, and of course, it's a beautiful dragon on this beautiful porcelain vase. So I have cartoon dragons. I have Japan has done dragon issues that had toys. I just couldn't copy all of my different things. I basically have two large albums full of different dragons that I have collected. And now I'm running into the issue that I'm starting to collect fairy tales. And so do I put my dragons from The Hobbit and from Harry Potter in my dragon book or in my fairy tale book? So, um, you know, those are issues that that are not... Um, not bad issues to have, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I was running into the same issue myself earlier today, trying to decide where to put um, things that had both buildings and flowers on them. <laughs> Remarkably, there's a lot of those. Oh. Um, <laughs> but speaking of uh, of issues to have, I do oh, have... good idea, Sarah. Two issues of each. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's I like the that. that's the good solution. Um, and hello again, hello to Sarah, who, uh, by the way, is one of our wonderful authors at Stamp Ed. Uh, you should definitely check out her articles. Uh, she's been in both issues so far. Uh, but we do have another poll up in the chat, which is a question that I have all the time. Um, so I would love to know what everyone thinks about it. Um, is there anybody else in the, uh, in the webinar who would like to, to share their stamps? Because if not, we can close out uh, with mine. <laughs> But we don't. We absolutely would love to. Uh, would love to share anybody else who has things to to share with us. On the poll, um, I'm. I think I'm landing on personally only collecting the stamps that are part of my topic. Um, when I was looking through uh, some of the ones that I don't have yet, that are you know from the same set, I was not interested at all in the other stamps of the set. So we'll have to see how the poll ends up, but that's my opinion at least. I see you have a prop, Foster. Yes. I love it. Quick, quick background. <laughs> my family is really into minions. And for one year at Christmas, they got three minion uh, greeters, these are called. And my nephew insisted I have one and one of the neighbors had a 10 foot inflatable Olaf they looked at every night. So they got me one. So I figured I, one day I was searching on eBay for something and found an Olaf stamp. And every once in a while I accumulate them. And this is a quick PowerPoint put together in, the, in about the last 10 minutes. So I'm going to move Olaf out of the way. Can you folks see, see the PowerPoint? Yep. This is, these are some of the random stamps that uh, show Olaf. This is a souvenir sheet from the Republic of Benin in Africa, where I doubt they have any snow, or I doubt I don't even know if they, they show show Olaf movies there. But uh, I have this as in this souvenir sheet and three more trial color proofs of it. And on, on the right stamp, there's Olaf uh, hanging on. 
Next, we have a souvenir sheet from Chad. Again, another African Republic. And my, my main interest is first day covers. So I, I really like this one. I found it on eBay. And we, we have two copies of Olaf on this one, one in the upper corner and one on this stamp here. Whether or not they made it to, to Chad, I don't know, but I really don't care because it had Olaf on it. We have a uh, personalized souvenir sheet. Uh, this one is from Israel. There's also a similar one for, for, from Australia, but, but I couldn't find the uh, scan of that very quickly. And one of the personalized stamps, there's Olaf once again. Uh, this is a combination Disney one of, of Frozen and Cars, but I liked it for Olaf. What, one of the first day covers I collect is by a person by the name of Hideaki Nakano passed away a few years ago, who was easily the most creative cache maker, did all kinds of things, origami, covers with multiple cancels, stickers, uh, first day covers on Christmas cards, greeting cards. But he did a couple uh, uh, with Olaf stickers on them, and they were on eBay, and as soon as I saw it, I hit buy it now, and he had this one, and this one to, to my, my Olaf mini collection. There's, a, again, Olaf hanging out up there. Olaf down here. And this is a mini collection. If anyone knows of it, any other Olaf stamps, I'll hunt for them on eBay. Uh, the ATA checklist is just snowman. And it was a little bit of help. I did find the Benin and, and Chad stuff in there. But so far, there's not an actual checklist on Olaf. So that's my mini topical collection on Olaf. And there's Olaf thanking you for your time. Thank you very much, Foster. Was like. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to have Sarah go right ahead. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, I'm excited to participate tonight. And and see some of you guys on screen. It's hard not to want to start new topical collections when you see what everybody else collects. Absolutely. Um, one of my main topics is the International Geophysical Year. So it ran from 1957 to 58. And it was an 18-month year. And 67 countries participated. And I feel like for such a large international endeavor, um, it's kind of left uh, common memory pretty quickly. So um, I guess Rob and I are trying to revive it. Um, so this is, a I'm, I'm very low tech today. This is a cover uh, that I used for my uh, one page exhibit, um, ATA one page exhibit uh, this year. It is signed by the president of the special committee that put together the International Geophysical Year Endeavor. Um, but one of the things that I enjoy most about the event was that um, it, it literally spanned the globe. So here is a cover from the world's northernmost community in Svalbard. And then one from the South Pole as well. So literally covering the whole planet. Um, there were 11 different um, sciences that they were researching during this endeavor. Uh, and the, the ones that interest me most are uh, related to um, early pre-NASA uh, space missions. So one of the things that I, I try to seek out are the rocket covers. So this is one of the rocket covers that the US flew on the first day of the geophysical year. It says it went from Douglas County, Nevada to Topaz, California, and it's postmarked in, in Topaz up here. That's it, that's all I had picked out. That's awesome. You had me immediately with the with the two the polars because that's one of my that was 
like my biggest topical interest. I love polar philately. So it, it seems like a lot of um, uh, dealers store the geophysical year stuff with their polar history. So I've, I've learned a lot about it through the polar history study groups and, and that kind of angle, but it's the, the rocket science that, that interests me most. Very cool. Just another uh, shout out, definitely check out Sarah's articles in Stamp Ed. I uh, particularly love uh, the one in the uh, new issue, the po Finding the Postmaster of Earth, or I forget exactly what we ended up calling it, but that's the gist of it. Uh, great article. Loved it. Thanks. All right. I think we have uh, one more. Uh, Jeff, um, I'm not sure if you want to be on camera or not, but I'm going to share my screen so we can see your wonderful exhibit here. Jeff is our senior editor at the American Philatelic Society. It's not um, feminism. It's just friends. <laughs> um, and he collects a lot of stuff. Um, I think his most recent article um, that he did for the AP was um, about the night train. And then he did an article about... Um, New York State Fair at Syracuse. Um, so I, you know, I, I live in Syracuse, a uh, long time hometown, really, and I uh, collect Syracuse items. But this is from, uh, I enjoy eating. Uh, so uh, I started uh, collecting topicals uh, fruits and vegetables. And that led me to, and it's like, okay, that's cool. And um, I just, I just actually, for once, I uh, tailored the food stuff to just breakfast. So this is just one page out of a, a breakfast, a one, uh, one panel uh, breakfast, philately for breakfast uh, exhibit I did. Uh, I want to redo it. Um, I showed it at Scopex a few years ago. Uh, Uh, Ken Martin in particular, and he pointed out a few things I could do to improve it. Um, so, but I haven't redone it yet. But anyway, so this is just simply the hash browns and home fries page from the exhibit. And uh, I had this kind of fun um, old time 1937 uh, event cover that uh, <clears throat> pays tribute to that area in West uh, Virginia or West Virginia. Uh, they're potato page and then uh at the bottom are a little more uh you know different they're uh, revenue stamps but you don't see them used because the uh, uh law went to into effect to use these stamps uh in 1935 but before they uh could be used and go into effect the the law was canceled so you, you pretty much only find these stamps mint uh i don't think that's all of them i, I Again, when I started, I know there's some others. So this, th these were revenue stamps for different poundage of uh, potato bags, I guess. Um, so anyway, so that was uh, just kind of a topical. Uh, and I just thought I'd share. I got very excited by uh, everybody else and, and sharing their wonderful things. And uh, it's been a great little show and tell. So that's that. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, like Jeff, I also love breakfast and potatoes and Syracuse, uh, funnily enough. Um, I have the two pound <laughs> potato revenue in my collection and I really enjoy um, that they decided to put, I, I, I guess she's supposed to look serene, but I think she looks dejected. Um, <laughs> and I think that's just a wonderful choice that someone made uh, at one point. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing. Yes, and yeah. Jeff, I'm sorry for forgetting the words um, state fair. <laughs> that's fine. That's, that's, that's fine. It's, it is the country's oldest state fairs. And, I'll mute myself. <laughs> yes, and that was in the July issue of the American Flatalist last year. Um, and that takes us to 8 p.m., which is about how long we hope to go. Um, 
uh, thank you so much for every uh, to everyone who came. Thank you to everyone who shared and chatted, answered polls. <laughs> um, I had a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. I did too. Thank you for letting us test this out on you. Um, I hope you all had fun as well. And I hope we can do something similar again in the future. Um, just a few last minute hypes. Um, uh, you should be receiving your uh, digital issue of the American Flatalist tonight if you're an APS member um, that's going live. We did a fun video uh, for the issue as well, um, <laughs> uh, which is what's in my bag uh, for uh, to prepare for a Great American Stamp Show. And I showed uh, what is in my bag that I'll be packing. Um, and I already know that I have a fan of the video. Uh, my baby nephew watched it and apparently he laughed a lot. So I'm sure <laughs> he's a harsh critic. Um, I hope you all enjoy the video as well. <laughs> and one last plug for Stamp Ed. We love it. It's our baby. Um, uh, if any of you are interested in revenues, we also have a article on proprietary, private dye proprietary revenue stamps <laughs> for <laughs> patent medicines. Um, it's a mouthful, mouthful. every time. <laughs> uh, but I had a lot of fun writing it, so I hope you enjoy reading it. Um, Oh, thanks, Leah. Uh, but yeah, please check out Stamp Ed. Please check out the new AP uh, and the, the new video. And I think that's about it. So hopefully we will see you all again uh, for another Stamp Chat just like this. Mm -hmm.